my career in side projects and open source. Basically, this is so I've been knocking around with um, uh, side projects and open source things for 20 years now, it turns out. And I realized recently that every key moment in my career started out as a side project. Um, so I've got a great track record of turning side projects into opportunities. Um, the, the next thing I want to do is turn uh, the, my, my current major open source side project into something that's sustainable without me having to go and work, work for somebody else um, or start another company. I'll probably start another company, we'll see. So um, I'm gonna show you a bunch of side projects I've worked on over the years and uh, talk through how they, in, how, they, um, how they sort of influenced where I ended up going. Um, so my first side project of note was a site that I launched in 1999. Um, this was an online gaming site. I, I was a keen player of Team Fortress Classic and I was in a clan and I was trying to run a league and all of that kind of stuff. And um, this was, I don't know if blogs were even a thing in 1999. This was, I consider this a news website. It was news about the game. And um, I had to, th this is, a, I, I, the aesthetic of this, I think, is very online gaming in the late 90s. I'm quite proud of that. Um, but this was a project that I span up to start building a community around this game that I was playing. And um, I, started, I, I started running this, this league for, for clans to compete. And that got me my first job in, in, in technology. I ended up taking two years before university, moved to London to work for this company called what, um, Gameplay, which was for a brief moment, the darling of the 1999 um, like London technology industry, it, it raised 88 million pounds and then lost all of it um, like in, in the dot-com crash. It was quite spectacular. I think at one point um, we were selling games online. Like the highest, what's that? Oops. I think we just had some um, background noise, okay. but we're muted um, now. <laughs> yeah, I think that the, the, the share price was like, uh, two pound twenty one when we when we actually when we IPO'd and then three and a half pence two years later when the company pretty much collapsed. Um, so I got to see the first dot com boom up close, which was really exciting. Um, but yeah, and that that so that came out from the sort of my first foray into into online news and such like. Um, luckily for me, I hadn't gone to university yet, so when the entire dot com industry crashed, I could go and shelter in academia for a few years and get my degree. Um, so after that, I spun up a, um, the, this, blogs were now a thing. So I started a blog um, God, nearly 20 years ago. Wow. And this was back when there were only about 100 people who were blogging about web development. So we all knew each other, which was really exciting. Because um, a chap I knew called Adrian Halavati was a journalist web um, developer in Kansas. And he posted a job, job opportunity. He said, hey, we're building local news websites in Kansas we've got a job opening. And um, this coincided with my British, my, my university in England giving me the opportunity to have a year in industry. So you can find a job somewhere. Um, if it's abroad, you can get a student visa, which was crucially useful. And you can go out, spend a year in, year in industry and then come back and finish your degree. So I ended up moving out to Kansas from, from, um, from Bath in England. This was my first proper experience of the United States. Um, this tiny little town called Lawrence, Kansas, population, I think, like less than 100,000 people, um, to work for a newspaper called the Lawrence Journal World. And this was an extraordinary job. Again, it sort of came out of this, my side project of just blogging about stuff. Um, um, it was extraordinary because while it was a tiny newspaper, it was really well funded. And um, the goal was always to punch so far above our weight that nobody could believe that we were a tiny little newspaper, um, tiny little local newspaper. And um, my favorite example, um, in, I'm sure as Americans, probably, I imagine most people in this call understand American culture better than I do. Americans are really into their kids' baseball and softball. So there was this softball league in the town and our boss, a guy called Rob Curley said, we're gonna treat these kids' softball teams like they're the New York Yankees. We're gonna do photos and team bios and schedules. I'm gonna let the parents sign up for SMS messages whenever their, their kids scores a, a, whatever you score in softball, a run. Um, and uh, we, we sent interns out and we took 360 degree photographs of every softball court in town to put up on the website. This was in what, 2002, 2002, no, 2003. Um, so it was QuickTime VR, I think we were using for this. So absolutely absurd levels of, of over the top interest in, in this kids softball stuff. Um, 
And because we had this culture of trying to punch way above our weight, Adrian and I had been experimenting with new ways of building websites. Um, we wanted to use Python. Um, we'd both been using PHP. And so we ended up building out this system for building websites. Um, like the, the kids softball thing we had to put together, we had a three day deadline to put that together. And um, shortly after I left the newspaper, we open sourced it. And that was, um, this is Django, the Django web framework, um, which was born in a local newspaper, the local newspaper in Lawrence, Kansas. And today it's used by Instagram and um, Discus and all so sorts of different places. So this as an open source project has been incredibly influential. I've got the, the chart of interest over time from, um, well, I think that's from Google Trends. Uh, oops, why did that happen? Um, and again, that this 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 came out of this came out of us working in a newsroom environment and needing to turn around relatively complex relational database web, websites in very very short amounts of time on journalism deadlines. Because the fun thing about working on news stuff is that. You know, if it takes you three months to build an application to support a story, there's no point in building it at all. You have to be able to, to publish things at the rate of the news cycle. Um, so based on all of that, uh, I ended up back in England working at The Guardian. Um, so The Guardian is one of the UK's leading newspapers. Um, they had, they were, this was around 2010, and they were coming off a three-year horrifying giant content management system like enterprise rebuild. So they were all relative, kind, kind of burned out and looking to try and start doing more of this sort of agile, um, very quick turnaround, like data, data journalism reporting stuff. So I came in to, to, to start doing those kinds of things. And I got to work on some really fun projects there. Um, there was a, actually, well, this was one of the first WikiLeaks stories. This was back in 2008, and WikiLeaks got their hands on the membership list of the BNP, the, 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 the far-right um, party in, in the UK, and it had 18,000 names on it. And The Guardian is not the kind of newspaper that publishes 18,000 people's names for, for being a members of a political party. So the question was, how can we, what is a responsible way of using this data that doesn't, like, you know, um, affect anyone's personal privacy. So what we ended up doing was um, um, was geocoding people's dresses to parliamentary constituencies so that we could generate a heat map of where the BNP had the most mem um, had the most party members in um, in the UK. And this was this was one of my first projects at the Guardian. The really exciting thing about it is that it got printed in the newspaper because I built this um, I built this using SVG. Um, and the great thing about SVG is that it's, it's vector quality and you can export it to Illustrator and put it out. So I've still got like five copies of this newspaper on, on the shelf behind me, I think. Um, but this also, this ties into this idea of side projects because one of the things I span out of this was an, a sort of internal pro uh, side project for The Guardian, which was a self-service tool where reporters could like up, at, uh, upload a, a list of parliamentary constituencies and numbers and get back one of these SVG heat maps. So the idea was to, um, and it was, we, I, I built that at one of the Guardian's internal hack days. Um, the problem I found is that um, a bunch of journalists started using this thing, which I'd knocked together in my sort of spare work time. And um, after I left the Guardian, a couple of years after I left, um, I met up with somebody who had worked with them. He said, yes, you, you know, you're, um, you left that thing running on your desktop computer under your desk. And so we had to leave your desktop turned on for six months. And then we had to figure out how to virtualize it and stick it in our data and in VMware and data center somewhere. And um, yeah, next time, next time, how about writing some deployment instructions? And so from that, I learned that um, you can cause certain amounts of, um, of chaos with, with these projects if you don't, don't assume that they're going to run for a lot longer than you thought they were going to run for. And I've become very interest, since, interested since then in documenting things, but also in making sure that companies have really good mechanisms for internal deployments of these kinds of projects. So it doesn't end up running on someone's desktop um, under a desk somewhere. Um, but the most fun project to work at The Guardian was another thing, again, something that started as a, um, a commute side project. I had a two hour train ride into work, which was just enough time to, to knock together prototypes of things. Um, and that was this tool for investigating your uh, member of parliament's expense claims. Um, there was a, 
ongoing freedom of information campaign to try and get the expense documents from our, our representatives. And when they finally came out, um, we had 450,000 pages of documents that we needed to go through. So we decided to try and do it with crowdsourcing. We put these all up on the website and we gave people a button to start reviewing random pages of MPs' expenses. So here's page 34 of Janet Dean's incidental expenses provision. And we'd ask our users to glance over it and click a button to say if they thought it looked interesting, should, should a journalism go, journalist go and look at it, that kind of stuff. Um, and interestingly with this project, the most important detail, the, the thing, that really helped to get working is that we stuck the MPs' official mugshots, their, their, their photographs, on the pages. Of course, they all look very smug and they're grinning in this. And it made people really angry. People were like, you're grinning at me and I'm looking, and I'm going to dive through your expenses and I'm going to find something on you. And so we had like progress bars and we had a, um, a, uh, a scoreboard. We gamified it a bit. So who, who's reviewed the most expenses? Who's the person who's, who's been going after um, High Well Francis the most and so on? Um, but it was really fun. And um, again, it was the, one of the ideas that, I, that, that, that one of the things that really um, sort of that, 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 that this really emphasized for me is the power of prototyping. Like if you can get a, a prototype up and running in front of people in a really short space of time, it's so much more valuable than just talking about an idea for something. Like most people, myself included, ideas will sort of bat around for hours. But if you give me something concrete, even if it's a very shonky like demo, as long as it works and I can see it, it focuses the conversation. And that's a trick I've used throughout my entire career. I, my, my, my first my first resort for almost any problem is, can I build some kind of prototype so I can get conversations going about what's actually feasible to do with this thing? But let's talk about side projects again. This is one of my all time favorite side projects um, from, my, from, from the past. Um, this is a site called Wildlife Near You. And the origin story of this is a bunch of nerdy friends of fr friends in England got together and we said, you know what would be really fun? Let's rent a fortress for a week and go and build stuff together. Like, let's have a week-long like, hackathon in some kind of fortress, because this fortress here, this is called Fort Clonk. It's in Alderney on the Channel Islands, like most of the way to France. And it's Napoleonic, it's from the Napoleonic era. And it only costs, I think, about $2,000 a week to rent, but it sleeps 14 people. So if you divide $2,000 by 14 people, we're talking like the price of a youth hostel to stay in a Napoleonic sea fortress with like a drawbridge and a flag and a bugle. And it's, oh my God, it was, the, it was, it was such a cool place. Um, and it, it actually, um, at high tide, it gets cut off from the mainland. The water comes over the causeway. And while we were there, there were horrific storms which would crash against the walls. But you're in a castle, so it doesn't matter. So um, like lightning and everything, it was, it was amazing. But yeah, we had this idea to rent a fort for a week and just see if we could build a thing together. Um, and so this is us on our fortress, um, nerding out on things. Um, a great thing about fortresses, they tend not to have internet connections, which is amazing for group productivity. And so we built a website where we, the, the, the question we were trying to answer, the crucial question is, where is my nearest llama? And so the way this worked, this, this site sadly no longer exists. Um, Wildlifenew.com, you'd go somewhere and you'd like go to a nature reserve or a zoo and you'd see things and you'd post a trip report. You'd say, I went to this the Gigrin farm and I saw a raven and a buzzard and a red kite. And you'd get a profile where you had your favorite animals and recent trips you'd taken and so on. But because we had this data, we could then let you search for llamas near Brighton and we can show you that the nearest llama to Brighton is Ashdown Forest Llama Farm, um, 18 miles away, as reported by somebody. And this was utterly delightful. Um, uh, we got pages for species. Here's the red panda page that tells you your nearest red panda is, and photographs of red pandas and where you can see them, and all of that. But then the problem we had with this page is we needed to show people, sh we needed a single photograph of a red panda to highlight. But how do we know which photograph of the red panda is better? So we built essentially hot or not for photographs of animals. So the idea is you'd go here and we'd show you two photos of a marmot and you'd say, well, clearly the picture on the right is a better photo of a marmot. And then we'd show you two photos of red panda and back and forth. And then we used the, alg the algorithm we used for this was the, the ELO algorithm from the one that's used in chess tournaments. And when that, the, the film The Social Network came out with Mark Zuckerberg about Mark Zuckerberg, 
there's a scene in that where he's building like hot or not for college students and it's the same algorithm that we used for our best marmot photo so i was i was thrilled to see that we had that that element of crossover there um but the really fun thing we did with world like you is we decided as a marketing ploy we'd try and this was a actually we eventually added a mobile location button when that technology became available but the idea here was it's just one question where are you and it would show you where your nearest owl is that was it and um one of the highlights of my career was when wired magazine in the uk who had a wired tired expired column listed owls near you in wired and foursquare in tired so in 2010, Owls Near You was, was hot stuff, according to, to Wired UK magazine. Um, the most important lesson I learned from this side project is if you're going to host something like this, don't hook up the hosting to an email address that you don't check on the credit card that expires and have backups on the same host. Because I stopped paying attention for a couple of months and the credit card expired and the hosting temp provider deleted the data and the backups were gone and it was really upsetting. Um, and so a really important lesson I hear, learned, learned from this is if you're building side projects, building side projects that are responsible for user data, where you've got users actually trusting your side project with their stuff, it's generally a really bad idea because if you do that, it's not a side project, it's a job, right? It's, you have this responsibility that, that really matters. Um, so I took that lesson and completely ignored it. Um, so uh, in 2010, uh, Natalie, Dan and myself got married um, and we had a golden eagle dog wedding, which was awesome. Um, and then we decided that we were going to quit our jobs and go off on honeymoon for as long as we could get away with. So take our laptops, travel around the world, try and like earn money from freelance clients and that kind of thing. And we got as far as Morocco. Um, this is uh so oh i'm not sure i can't remember where we took that photograph actually um and we discovered the client work was a bit tricky because you have unreliable internet and you know inevitably on the day when you've got access to a good internet connection the client hasn't sent you the thing they said they were going to send you but working on side projects together was great that's very compatible with riding around on camels and and, and having fun exploring things um and so we started building the side project that was Basically, it was to solve a problem we were having, which was that our friends kept on going to really cool events and conferences and things, which we hadn't heard of, and so we were missing out. Um, and we ended up, we had a launch party for our side project at Rick's Cafe, which actually exists in Casablanca, which is very exciting. Um, and we released the site called lanyard.com. And lanyard was the, um, the social conference directory. The idea was it's a site where you can go to see what conferences people you know are going to or speaking at and add your own conferences and generally do that. And we, I remember when we built it, we were thinking, you know what? Even in tech, there's at least 100 conferences a year. There must be thousands of conferences in, in all of the industries, which was underestimating by about a factor of 100. Um, but the key idea was um, you sign in with Twitter, we look at who you follow on Twitter, and we show you events that those people are going to or speaking at. And the speaking at bit turned out to be crucial because when we added conference, we'd list the, the speakers by their Twitter IDs, which meant that on the first day we launched, um, there was just Natalie and I working on the site, but we had over a hundred profiles of users because they were people who were speaking at conferences that we had listed. And that meant that anyone who signed in who followed one of these people would get a recommendation and speakers have a lot of followers. And so, the thing went naturally viral and within, within a few days, it was, it was going far, far beyond what we thought it was, what, what we ever expected from this, this little side project we were building on our honeymoon. Um, so you had conference listings pages and profile pages where you can see the events that people have given. given. We had vid um, embedded videos and slides and all of that kind of stuff. And so this, you know, I, I said the golden rule is don't build a side project with user data. This was a side project with user data and it was, um, taking off way, way faster than we'd ever expected. So we ended up cutting Honeymoon short and applying for Y Combinator um, from Luxor in Egypt. Um, I, I, uh, we have a Y Combinator ask you to send in a um, application video, like a 60 second video. Ours has the, has, no, it was Aswine, wasn't it? Ours has a, an, a, an Egyptian temple in the background, which we decided to, to have there as, sort of background thing but not actually mentioned in, in the spiel that we gave um and we got accepted into y combinator in uh, for the winter 2000 and winter 2011 um 
was it winter? I can't remember. Winter 2011, um, ended up cutting a honeymoon short, moving out to Mountain View and spending three months doing the whole Y Combinator thing. After which we moved back to London and raised money from investors and we hired a team and we spent three years doing the, the turning, turning Lanyard into a startup. Um, well, it was a startup to, trying to figure out how to evolve it as a startup. And then in 2013, we negotiated a, um, a, a, an exit. Uh, Lanyard was acquired by Eventbrite. Um, the entire team, all six of us, I think 10, including family members, moved out to, um, moved out to San Francisco. Um, and to be honest, uh, one of the reasons we sold is we had, the, we had to choose between finding an acquisition or raising a Series A. And when you raise a Series A, that commits you to another five to 10 years working on that project, right? That's, that's a, that is locking yourself into a track. And one of the questions we had to ask ourselves was, is this the project that we want to spend the next 10 years of our life working on? And honestly, we enjoyed the project. We thought it was valuable and useful, but it wasn't that, it didn't have that, this is the thing we want to dedicate ourselves to vibe. So it was, um, we, we, we found a, we found a, an acquisition target that did, did well for the investors and for ourselves and for our team. And, and you know, it, I think it, it worked out pretty well. Um, so I spent six years at Eventbrite and I got to ride the, I got to ride the, um, that hockey stick from, I think it was about 150 people and it was over a thousand people when we left. So in a way, by getting up, by selling our startup to another company, we got to jump about five years ahead in the startup trajectory and see what it was like to go through that, that crazy period of growth. Um, and at Eventbrite, one of the things, one of the things I discovered was the joy of internal company side projects. Um, so I moved into an engineering management role and one of the one of the truths of engineering management is you can still work on code, but you can never put yourself in the critical path of getting anything shipped. Because if you do that, it just leads to terrible management and terrible, terrible contributions and it, it, it seizes everything up. But if you want to keep your sort of technical brain ticking over, it's great to have projects that you can, that you can work on. Um, and so my favorite internal side project was um, this thing here. Um, I called it doc search. Um, we re I realized that Eventbrite, we had this problem where everyone thought our documentation was terrible. Our documentation was amazing, but it was in 10 different systems. It was in Confluence and GitHub wikis and um, Jira tickets and um, something called, this thing called Continue and the support website, and all of this, and Google Docs and all of this stuff. And so I built a side project where basically it would run a bunch of um, scheduled crons, pull in the content from all 10 different systems, stick it in a single search index, and give you an interface over the top. And so here I can search for Varnish and it shows me all of the documents that mention Varnish across Google Docs and Confluence and so on. And um, great thing about side projects like this is nobody gets to tell you what it should do. So at one point I got a little overexcited and decided to add facet by emoji. So you can, you can, so we get a list of the emoji that show up in the different documents. And if you just want to see the varnish documentation that includes the rainbow emoji, you can click on that and, and see it that way. Um, I added a glossary at the top and, and that kind of thing. And this was part of Eventbrite's culture as well, is Eventbrite, as many companies do, um, had hack days. So a few times a year, we'd have a day where everyone gets to drop what they're supposed to be doing and work on a creative project that lets them try out new technology or experiment with ideas they think would be interesting. Um, and I adore hack days. We did them at the Guardian. Um, I was in, I was used to, I worked a long time ago, I worked at Yahoo, where I was part of the team that started the first Yahoo hack day. And I feel like it's a really useful release valve for larger companies to, to, to make sure that people don't just get burned out and, um, compl and, and frustrated that they're not getting to explore outside of the projects they're working on in a day to day. Um, but I've come to, so, one of the other side projects, well, a more recent side project I worked on um, was something which I think illustrates the ideals, um, the, the ideal, um, the ideal si characteristics of side project. Um, I showed you owlsnearyou.com earlier. This website is called Owls Near Me, and you can go there right now. It's owlsnearme.com. Um, Natalie and I built this uh, on Super, Super Bowl Sunday a few years ago because in England everyone makes fun of it and calls it superb. Owl Sunday. So we figured it was a good day to be promoting a superb owl website. And so owlsnearme.com, you go there, you click use my location, and it shows you where your nearest owl is. 
Um, but the way it does it is it uses this amazing website called iNaturalist, which is somebody else's crowdsourced project to gather where people have seen things. Um, and it's got a really good API. So owlsnearme.com is a tiny little piece of HTML and JavaScript. It's a little React app. It talks to this API. It has no database. It's just static HTML. And it's absolutely the best kind of um, side project. It's cheap to host and it can't break. I don't have to worry about server backups and um, Unix um, systems administration and all of that. All of the data comes from somebody else's API, so we're not responsible for any of that stuff. And we're not responsible for any user data either. So there is basically nothing that can go wrong with this, which I think makes it the, the perfect side project. It's super fun. Um, like it's, 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 pe people really enjoy it. And it's almost no mental overhead at all on us. Um, but I did end up working on a new kind, for me, a sort of new kind of side project, which is the thing that's, that's beginning to, to take over my career now. So, um, about, so almost exactly three years ago, um, when I was still at Eventbrite, I started this project called Dataset, which is an open source project to help people explore, analyze, and publish their data. And the inspiration for this was some work that I did back at The Guardian. Um, when I first joined The Guardian, um, one of the people I met there was a reporter called Simon Rogers, who was the Guardian's sort of data nerd reporter. He sat in the newsroom and he had a hard drive full of Excel spreadsheets. And anytime somebody wanted to do a visualization or an infographic, Simon Rogers was the person they'd ask for the data. And he he could get you data on absolutely anything. He, he was like phoning up Russian cultural departments and, and arguing with them over the phone and trying to get them to email him things and so on. He was absolutely amazing at it. Um, and so I said to him, you've got all of these spreadsheets. What, what happens to them? He goes, oh, I've, I've got them archived on my hard drive. And so he had a, a hard drive with hundreds and hundreds of immaculate Excel spreadsheets of data around the world. And so we started brainstorming how we could publish this stuff. Like, what more can we do with this? And we started a thing called the Guardian Data Blog, where basically we published things in Google Sheets. So a story would go out in the newspaper, which was with an, an infographic, and then we put a post up on the Guardian Data Blog with a Google Sheet that had all of that raw data in it. And we built up a, it, this worked really well. We had a, a Flickr group of um, amateur data viz people who would take data from the Guardian's data blog and visualize it and remix it and so forth. It was fantastic. Um, the one frustration I had with it is I felt like there should be a better way than Google Sheets of publishing this data, right? If you're publishing data to the world, is Google Sheets really the sort of state of the art in data sharing? Um, and so the idea behind Dataset is to address, the original idea was to address exactly that problem. And actually, I'll switch to a demo because that's the easiest way to, to show you what this, kind of, what, what this thing looks like. So Dataset is a web application for exploring data, plus a bunch of tools for, for deploying these web applications online. Um, this is a data set of global power plants by the World Resource Institute. It's 33,000 rows. And I mean, it's a table of data. So you've got a country and the name and the capacity and the latitude and longitude. But the data set adds a bunch of extra stuff on top of it. It adds, um, there's a feature called facets, which is essentially pivot tables or group by counts in SQL, where it can say, okay, there are 8,000 um, power plants in the United States, 4,000 in China, the primary fuel is solar, hydro, wind, that kind of thing. Um, but it also does, um, it also has a plugin mechanism that lets you add visualizations. So here, I'm, I've just clicked load all. I'm loading all 33,000 power plants in the world onto this map, um, which instantly starts showing you interesting things. Like, um, there are two power plants in Antarctica, for example. Um, let's, let's see what those are. Um, here we go. Um, so McMurdo Station has a oil-powered generator, and they've also um, got a wind generator down there um, owned by Meridian Energy, which is kind of interesting. Thing. Um, but you've also, with the facets, you can do things like um, say, you know what, just show me the, new, the 198 nuclear power plants in the world of which 61 in the United States, 19 are in France. Let's click on France. Now I'm seeing the 19 nuclear power plants that exist in France. Um, and if I want to do more stuff with that, I can export it. So anything you can see in here, you can get out as CSV. This is a CSV file of nuclear power plants in France. I can get it out as JSON if I want to do visualization work against it. Um, so the core initial idea here was given any shape of data set, if you can get it into 
like relational database tables, stick it in a SQLite database because those are very cheap and inexpensive to run. You can, you can then deploy it online and other people can, you, you can explore it, other people can explore it and they can start building integrations against it. Um, and this turned out to be absolutely the perfect project for me because I love side projects and having a side project which itself kicks out more side projects. Like I can do global power plants one day and um, little mu weird museums the next day and uh, foreign agent registration lobbyists and all of these different things. Um, it's, 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 it's pretty much everything that I, it, it ticks all of the boxes and keeping me engaged and interested. Um, and so I worked on this as an open source project for a year and a half. Um, and then I heard about this opportunity at Stanford University where they have a fellowship program for journalists. So it's called JSK Fellowships. And the idea is they get a bunch of journalists from around the world. They pay them to spend a year at Stanford thinking about interesting problems. And uh, kind of, to be honest, it was, there's an aspect of it where it's also helping like journalists not get too burned out and so forth. Um, and somebody said, you know what, this project here you, is exactly the kind of thing they'd be interested in. So I applied for that and got in and spent, got to spend a full year, a full academic year at Stanford, being essentially paid to think about stuff and tinker on things that I thought were interesting, which on the one hand was absolutely amazing. On the other hand, I think it's ruined me because that fellowship ended a few months ago and I have no desire to go and get a full-time job working on anything other than things that I find interesting. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's me sat in the corner with, with a bunch of ludicrously talented journalists from around the world. It was super exciting. I learned, I learned a huge amount there. Um, and so a few of the lessons I've learned from, from Dataset. Um, so Dataset is aggressively open source. Um, and I did that mainly because I've run a startup and it sold and it shut down. And I know full well that the trajectory of most startups and most projects is to eventually peter out. But I'm building software for journalists, right? If I want newsrooms around the world to use my software, I do not want to then have that software become unavailable to them. You know, the news industry is in enough trouble already without me, um, without me causing more problems by, you know, yanking the rug out from underneath them. So from the start, I wanted it to be um, open source. And one of the things that I found has worked incredibly well for this is I have a plugin system for it, which was mainly inspired by WordPress. You know, with WordPress, you've got a decent CMS with 7,000 plugins that mean it can solve any publishing problem in the world. Um, and I'm kind of, so I figured if I can get the same kind of thing going for my project, then all of these visualizations and features that I'd never even have dreamed of, other people can start contributing. So Dataset supports plugins. There are 47, about 50 plugins at the moment. I wrote all but three of them, but that's okay. You know, writing plugins for your own system is a great way to, to make sure that it's working. Um, this is the new Dataset website, which I launched actually just last week, which has a plugins directory where you can see like I've got the, the, the map I showed you earlier is a plugin that visualizes latitude and longitude data. I've got a GraphQL plugin and code search and charts and all sorts of bits and pieces. And this plugin thing has been so incredibly liberating for me because the joy of plugins is I have a crazy idea for a feature. Normally you wouldn't add that to your project because there's that risk that the feature, if it turns out it's a bad idea, your, your project gets craftier and craftier and craftier and eventually it collapses. But with plugins, the risk of, ad of trying out a new feature falls to almost zero. So as an example, um, I, love, I love SQL. Um, I was very skeptical about GraphQL. And so I built a GraphQL plugin for Dataset to prove that GraphQL was a dumb idea. Like it, it and, um, Actually, it had the opposite effect. I really liked it, and now I'm much more on the GraphQL train than I used to be. But the fact that I have this plugin system meant I could try out something which I thought was actively gonna be a bad idea, but I could still invest in it and experiment with it, put it out there, iterate on it independently of core. Um, and that's been brilliant. And like, like um, just yesterday, somebody released a plugin that adds a new charting feature to Dataset, which, and because it's, um, because it's a plugin based, 
they don't even have to file a pull request and have me review their code. Like literally I woke up in the morning and my software had gained features, which is, I mean, that's the dream, right? And if, if you don't have to do any work at all and somebody makes your project better, I don't see how it gets any, any, any cooler than that. Um, and what this, what the thing that really excites me about this project is I said earlier with lanyards, we didn't think that this was our 10 year project with data set. I think it is like, I'm enjoying it today, even more than I was when I started it three years ago. And I could absolutely see myself still, still being thrilled to work on this project in 10 years time. And that's a rare thing. Like, I don't think opportunities like that come along very often in careers. It's certainly, this is the first time in my career I found a project I felt has that kind of longevity to it. Um, and you know what, I'm gonna show you a very quick bonus, um, uh, um, a very quick bonus project um, that I've been building on top of Dataset. Uh, this is um, an idea I started exploring at Stanford where I realized that there was all of this data about me in the world. All of these like, companies have all of the data about me and I can get it back out of them. A lot of them have APIs, a lot of them have GDPR exports where you can click a button and get a zip file of all of your Facebook data and all of your Twitter data and so forth. So I started building a project called Dog Sheep where the idea is to gather all of my personal data into a private data warehouse running on top of Dataset that lets me explore it. And my favorite demo from Dog Sheep is um, every time I check in somewhere on Swarm with my dog Cleo, I use the wolf emoji in the Swarm check-in message which means that I can, run a data, I can run a SQL query where I look for things where the, the check-in message contains the wolf emoji, which because it's got latitude and longitude, it gets visualized on maps. So this is my dog's personal map of her favorite places based on her swarm check-ins, which is clearly a, that is a killer app. That's something that's, that's very worth spending, spending a lot of engineering time figuring out. Um, and if you're interested in that, uh, I gave a talk at, um, uh, the GitHub speaker series a few weeks ago about this called Personal Data Warehouses, which goes into a full demo of, um, of all of the other ludicrous things I've been able to do with this. I have a copy of my genome that I can query using SQL now, which is, is, is super exciting. Um, but yeah, jumping back. Um, so the challenge I have right now is I found my 10 year project. I need to do it sustainably, right? At the moment, I'm not making any money at all because I don't want to have a job because I'm having too much fun. And so I've started spinning, I've got a consult, some consulting gigs at the moment around this. Um, and I'm also, I'm most of the way through building out a, a, a sort of hosted version of this, the SaaS version, because one of the problems I found with this, um, with open source software is I'm building tools for journalists, but if they have to like install it on their computer and figure out a Python development environment and then work out where to host it somewhere, it's just not going to happen. It's unreasonable to ask people to, to self-host this kind of software. Um, so I'm starting to figure out how I'm going to do the sort of pay me, pay me per month for your team's private in data set instance. Um, but yeah, that's a sort of lightning tour of, uh, of, my, of my, my, my sort of story so far. And like I said, really, the, um, the thing I realized is it was the side projects that led to basically everything. Every opportunity I've, I've had along the way started out as some kind of side project that I was tinkering on. And then if I was lucky, that turned into a great opportunity. And if I was unlucky, it would it turned into sort of a tragic, um, like backup failure. But, uh, but you know, you, you learn stuff from every single one of these. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's where I am right now. I'd love to, love to take questions and just have a, a conversation about some of, some of these themes. Hi, Simon. My name is Xander. My internet connection is a bit poor here, so I hope I don't cut out. Um, I hope this question isn't presumptive, uh, but do you play Dungeons and Dragons? I haven't done in a very long time. Okay, thanks. I was just curious. So here's a more substantive question. Uh, what did you learn about graphical, GraphQL, from your experiment that changed your mind about it? Uh, you actually, you, 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 you misspoke and gave, gave, gave the reason. It's, it's graphical. It's the, so the thing with GraphQL is that um, it includes this incredibly powerful like interactive um, API explorer, which, oh, hold on. Uh, that's the wrong one. Let's do GitHub. 
two sweet boy, rough trail. Um, so, graf so graphical is this interface here, and it's got amazing autocomplete, like I can type, um, here we go, apparently I can get back the email field, uh, which is blank. But yeah, it's, um, it's absolutely superb, right? The, um, as an interface for mucking around with APIs, this, this is just so good. And so yeah, for me, this was the killer feature, the fact that I can start with a relational database, the plugin that I've built uses, for, it, for, it figures out foreign key relationships to add nested fields and all of that kind of stuff. And it means that with, I install this one plugin and suddenly I've got full, um, like full autocomplete uh, access to my entire data model, which I, I, I love that. Um, and also the um, I, GraphQL is so good at doing the nested thing. The fact that I can say, give me back my repositories for each repository, give me the five most recent issues for each issue, give me the name of the, the, the name of the person who filed it, all of that. It's, it's awesome. So yeah, for that, the other thing is that um, one of the reasons I was skeptical of GraphQL is that at Eventbrite, our front end developers kept on saying, we should use GraphQL. And I was part of the back end team, I was on the architecture team, and we were looking at that thinking, how are we gonna do that without you completely crashing the website? You're gonna spark off 500 SQL queries with every feature that you build, it's gonna be a disaster. Um, but Dataset is built on top of um, this database called, C database called SQLite. And the one thing that SQLite is particularly good at is handling 500 queries at once because with like MySQL or Postgres, each query is a round trip to a server somewhere. With SQLite, it's a C function call to a local file on disk. So something that triggers 500 queries in SQLite is like calling 500 functions, it's fine. Um, but yeah, so uh, I, I just, I, I got hooked on it because of, because of graphical essentially. Thanks. Do we have more questions for Simon? Hey, Simon, uh, I have a question. Uh, so you definitely built a lot of fascinating site projects and I'm curious on how do you, uh, when you, when you finish building something, how do you promote it? Is it usually to your friends or do you put it up on some forums? So it's discoverable uh -huh. by, by the mass number of mass, uh, websites. Uh, I wonder how do you go about it? So one joy of side projects is I don't feel the pressure to promote them too widely. You know, if like Al's near me, honestly, if I find it amusing and if I occasionally show it to somebody on my phone, that's completely fine. But at the same time, you know, I've, I've got 20 odd thousand followers on Twitter. So I promote stuff on Twitter um, and that, that, that's great. And then for the technical stuff, like um, data sets, uh, mainly I go for things like Hacker News. Um, like I've got quite a good track record of getting onto the Hacker News homepage with some of these things. And that drives an absurd amount of traffic. Um, so yeah, if it's so, um, when we were running Lanyard, I did a lot of promotion of it on Quora and places like that. So I feel like subreddits are really good for depending on, 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 on the project. Um, and then I finally, a, f a month ago, I finally started an email newsletter because that's clearly like a massive wasted opportunity if you're not, if you're not doing that, if you've got a, a topic that, that, that people might want to subscribe to. So I have a thing called the... Um, the data set weekly newsletter, which I do not send out weekly. Um, it's normally two or, two or three times a month, but this is, um, this is where I'm starting to build up that mailing list. And the moment I started doing this, I've been kicking myself because you actually get people's email addresses. Like for the first time in three years, I have actual contact details for people who care about the thing that I'm building. Um, so I'm kicking myself for not having started doing that much, much earlier. Got it. That's great. Thank you. Anyone? Simon, uh, thank you very much for your work on Django. I am a huge fan and I, I use it for all my projects. So thank you for cool. planting that seed all those years ago. Um, are you curious how you are exploring the different paths to some kind of funding slash revenue stream i'm curious about that too um still, i'm definitely <laughs> still figuring out if there's anyone on the call who's successfully commercialized an open source project i'd love to talk to you um i mean i'm starting to pick, pick up some consulting things which work it feels like the SaaS thing would be the most likely to become sustainable over time because you know once you've got monthly recurring revenue and you can keep on growing that that's that's it feels like many of the 
open source businesses that I really respect. That's one of the things that work for them. And I am getting, I'm getting inbound interest from some investors, which is always a great position to be in. Um, we, I've done a funded startup before Lanyard. We raised $1.4 million. Um, and there's a lot of stress, you know, where if you've raised $1.4 million, your, your time no longer entirely belongs to you. So what I'm thinking I want to do with this one is I'd much rather bootstrap it to a point where it's, where it's you know, sustainable for, for me to make a decent income. And then I feel like once you've bootstrapped it, if you do want to expand it and raise money, you raise money in a much better term because you don't, you, you know, you don't need their money to keep on going. Um, so there is a potential world in which I bootstrap up to being sustainable and, that, and then raise money from investors. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm hesitant. And partly, you know, it's, uh, if, if this has not been a great year for, for making long-term plans, you know. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm thinking about at the moment. I got, I, and do you think journalists, journalists are going to be your kind of focal market, given your background? I mean, no, because they haven't got any money. Mm. Um, I mean, my, well, my feeling around journalists is, so data journalism is a really interesting speciality. And um, I go to this, uh, data, this conference called NICAR, the um, Computer Assisted Reporting Conference, because that's what they called it back in the 70s when they started using mainframes to help with reporting stories. Um, and they're an amazing bunch. And I think there is enough money in like newsrooms to to at least start the ball rolling. But the real theory I have is if I can build software that helps journalists break stories, that, those features for corporate strategy departments and think tanks and analysts, uh, they all have to solve the same kinds of problems. So it feels like I've got an initial niche audience who, are, who would be amazing to, to, get the, to, to get the ball rolling and make sure I've got the right kind of feature set, but aren't gonna make me a huge amount of money. But tools that work for them should work for the people who do have the money. That, that's my theory anyway. Yeah, I mean, if I, if I think about what you just showed with data set, I mean, I, I don't know the inside details of Palantir, but it doesn't seem too far off <laughs> the kind of platform that they have. Well, this is the thing. It's like there are, there's lots of activity around big data, right? There are loads of companies, Palantir and Snowflake and all of these companies who are like, you've got terabytes of whatever, we will help you solve, solve, solve problems on top of it. But meanwhile, nobody seems to be targeting small data. And my definition of small data these days is data that won't fit on my phone. And I think this phone's got a terabyte of space on it now, or it's like half a terabyte. So small data is still pretty sodding huge. And in journalism, um, the interesting data sets you look at tend to be 100 megabytes. So like I've got one I'm looking at the moment that's three gig. And three gigabytes works completely fine on a laptop or on cheap hosting. Um, so part of what I'm thinking about is, Okay, what are the opportunities in the sort of small at the smaller end of data? Most companies, to be honest, only have in the order of gigabytes of, of data that they actually want to analyze. You know, you might have give terabytes of log files somewhere, but for the most part, and at Eventbrite, we had a data warehouse team and a giant expensive data warehouse costing tens of thousands of dollars a month. And I was still using data set to solve certain problems where I'd suck down a couple of thousand records that I needed to investigate more closely, get them in data set on my laptop and start digging through them. That was one of the, the points at which I realized that this thing was, was genuinely useful beyond just mucking around with publishing power plant data or whatever. Um, and the, um, likewise, the, the personal data warehouse stuff, you do not need um, your own copy of Palantir for your tweets and your emails and so forth. But there's app, like everyone I show the um, full demo to, it's like, no, this is clearly a valuable thing. This is useful to me. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in exploring that sort of, the, the, what you can do with small data. Oh, the other um, great example these days is Airtable. Airtable is a phenomenal product. And that is not for terabytes of data. Like Airtable is for, um, actually somebody pointed out to me recently that Airtable is for data that you can manually enter, right? You're not gonna pull in gigabytes of log files into an Airtable, but if you've got a team who need to maintain their own sort of inbuilt, um, at home built CRM or whatever, Airtable's absolutely perfect. And there's a possible world where data set evolves into the open source alternative to Airtable, but there are also about half a dozen other possible worlds that data set might evolve into. So I'm still, still trying to figure out which direction I, sh I should focus it in. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you.
it's actually genuinely one of the hardest problems I have for this project is explaining what the hell it is because you can data set it's, it's a Swiss army knife you can do so much stuff with it um, my latest attempt is I've got a page on the data set website of use cases where I'm going to add I'm deliberately going to add about a 20 just to try and get across the message that this does a lot this can be used to do a lot of different stuff I mean I think the key things are exploratory data analysis, instant data publishing, and rapid prototyping. But I use it for like digital forensics. I use it, um, I've used it for security, um, responding to security incidents. Um, I build, the data set website is data set. It's just with a custom theme and, and template, so it doesn't look like it. Um, one of my other side projects is a website to help, um, where I post reviews of tiny museums that I've been to. Um, so things like, uh, um, the New Orleans Historic Voodoo Museum and so on. Um, before the pandemic, this was a great hobby because any town you go to, there's going to be a weird little museum somewhere that's about pharmacies or voodoo or whatever it is. And so I've been trying to build, build up a, I'm build, essentially building a database of weird museums I've been to. Um, and again, this is, this is data set, but it's with a custom theme. It's got a use my location button. So it's, it's weird museums near you. I'm 0.16 miles away from the Comic Rockstar's Toilet Seat Museum. Has anyone seen this? This is, if you're in San Francisco. Okay, so in Hayes Valley, in, there's a comic book store called Isotope. And this is the, the guy who runs Isotope. And he collects um, toilet seats that have been illustrated by famous comic book artists. Like they come to his store and he gives them a toilet seat and they illustrate it. And he's got like over a hundred of these things now. And it's like a, that's like Warren Ellis and people like that have illustrated his toilet seats. And if you go in there or today, if you go to the window and, and, and look in, you can see this amazing collection. Um, and that to me, this is, this is, this is what life is about, right? It's finding, finding the people who collect the, the toilet seats with the illustrations on. So yeah, but niche museums here is just, it's, um, it's data set. Uh, if you go to slash browse, here's my database table of museums um, on a map. Um, and yeah, the, um, and then the, the, the homepage is a custom template that, that adds images and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so Dataset does that too, um, which means that I don't have the, I definitely don't have the, the, the right elevator pitch for it yet. If you give me 15 minutes, I can explain the project to you, but that's not really a, that's not really a great way of, of explaining what something does. It's challenging as well because it comes down to, oh, what's that marketing term? Um, it's pinning or framing or something. That thing where if I say that data set is a data warehouse, it will be compared to Hive and Snowflake and, and so on. If I say that it is like Airtable or, or a personal database, it'll be compared to Airtable and Access and Excel. And at the moment somebody starts comparing to one of those tools, they get a fixed idea of what it can do, what kind of money they should be spending on it, all of that. So it's, it's tricky. Um, but, you know, I, the more conversations I have about it, the better I get it. The, the closer I get to figuring out how to explain it to people, I think. Um, that was incredible. I, uh, I have a question, which is like a bit of a meta question, I, which is uh, how do you storm and, and, and like, how do you go about, uh, not specifically daily basis, like for example, but for like a feature um, and how do you keep fresh, like you know, stay at it fresh, but also be able to brainstorm to build that out all the way through? Is hmm. there, so partly the big cheat that I have is I basically only work on projects where I know that it's going to be really easy to build or I know it's going to be quick. So I've spent basically, I've spent the last 20 years hoarding little like cheat, cheat like little tricks that I can use. And then once every now and then something comes along and I think, you know what, because I've built this in the past and because of this and because of that, this is a project that will take me, take me a couple of days and I can launch it. And honestly, I don't work on projects that take more than a week before I can put something out there. Most of the plug plugins I write are a couple of hours and then I stick out the initial release. And that's something I learned. Um, I mean, that's, it's the release early, release often thing. It turns out that's so important for side projects because the alternative is that you never ship your side projects. Um, Wildlife Near You, the, the thing that we built in a fort, um, we worked on it for, for a week together on this fortress. And then we took it home with just a few more details to, to, to finish off. And 12 months later, we finally shipped it because it was just like, oh, it'll be perfect if we just add this one integration with Flickr. And if we just do this and just do this and just do this. And of course, we launched it and instantly everyone ignored most of the features we built. And they cared about this one little thing that we, we didn't know was important. So the, the thing I learned from that is 
yeah, your, your product isn't, it, I, I, a side project almost isn't a side project until either other people can see it or at least you're actively using it yourself. Um, and so, yeah, that's something I'm, I'm very, very passionate. Like, uh, I've got this um, personal homepage on GitHub where, you know, GitHub have this personal readme thing. And so I built a personal readme, which is self-updating. It has a GitHub action, which runs a couple of times an hour and pulls some feeds and, 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 and um, puts them in there. But my favorite bit of this is this, that these are the releases that I'm making to my projects. So this is every time I tag something as a released version and push it out to the Python package index or whatever. And I'm, most days I have at least one release of something because, because I'm trying to release early and release often. Um, and so I will, I will add a, a bug fix and I'll ship a bug fix release. And that's, that's, you know, that's done and that's out there. Um, so yeah, that releasing and releasing often, going after the projects that are really easy. Um, here's a really fun example. Uh, this is something I put out a couple of weeks ago. This is a code search engine um, that does a regular expression code search against all of my projects, which is a ridiculously ambitious thing to build, except in this case, it took, the best part of a day because it's running this I, there's this open source tool called whip grep which is amazing and this is about about 100 lines of python code adding a simple web interface on top of whip grep so it take it takes this this really like ambitious idea for a thing and turns it into a very quick turn it turn, turn it around in a few hours i've made a few enhancements to it since then but um it's a huge cheat right this is this is this project exists solely because I was like, holy shit, RipGrep has a JSON export, which means that I can plug it to this thing and write some code, which means I can build a code search engine. If it was going to take longer than a few hours, I wouldn't have done it. Um, and actually, that's a philosophy I have around data set itself, is I think there's something really interesting about tools or technologies that take the amount of effort required to do something down from... And like, even if you've got something that would take a week, like public, if you're a newspaper and you want to publish data about the local nursing homes and you need to have an engineer work on that for a week to get up a web interface with, with like a JS, JSON export and stuff, you're not going to do that. You cannot afford a week of engineering time for that. But if data set drives, drops that down to a couple of hours, then you will do it. So there's this sort of activation energy where there are tools and, and techniques that take something which is going to take long enough that you're not going to select that as a thing to do and drop it down below the bar and then you, and, and then let you do it and I, I love that kind of thing like that to me is if you build if, if I can build a tool that means I can do a dozen more projects in the future that I wouldn't have done otherwise because they'd have taken too long that's 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 enormously valuable and again the data set plugins play into all of that everything I'm building around here is about trying to put the least amount of effort into the most amount of of sort of value and, and, and stuff that I can do with it. Incredible. Thank you. That was rich. Thanks. Well, it looks like we're at time. Uh, thank you, Simon, so much for speaking with us today. That was super interesting. And um, please come back and talk with us again. I'd, I'd, I mean, especially if, if anyone's got any insight into how I can, well, it's not just, um, it's not just like commercializing open source. It's just straight up figuring out how to do, how to set up decent contracting uh, consulting gigs that support this kind of thing as well. I'd love to, 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 to swap, swap, um, to swap notes with people on how to do that. Definitely. Why don't you, um, could you, do you mind if people contact you? Oh, absolutely. No, um, uh, please, please feel free to reach out for me, uh, reach out for me. Okay, great. Maybe you can put your email address in the um, chat box. Um, I, there we go. So I'm swillison at gmail.com. Um, oh, and I'm on Twitter as well. There we go. Hold on, I think you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, my internet's been spotty today, but thank you so much again. Um, I'll save that email address and I'll post it maybe in Slack um, so everyone can access it. Thank you again, and we- oh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was, it was great meeting you all.
Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Thank you.